later this morning. Our speaker today is Emily Philos, and Emily is the SRA research agronomist, and she's based up at Moringa, which is just south of Cairns. Emily has 12 years experience in Australian sugarcane weed agronomy, as well as previous international experience. And due to the amount of content in Emily's presentation, we'll be splitting the weeds um, presentation into two webinars and the time and the date for the second seminar, we'll advertise that over the, next, over the coming weeks. Um, today's meeting is being recorded and uh, we ask that you keep your microphones on mute to keep the background interference noise to a minimum. I'll assist as co-host to ensure that all runs smoothly and uh, we also have a number of other SRA staff in the meeting. If you have any technology issues, please send the message in the chat box, which is up on the top menu bar of your screen. Um, we encourage you to take an active part in today's meeting by asking questions, but we ask that you re um, wait until the end of the presentation to do this. Um, although if you got uh, questions during the presentation, um, Put them in the uh, in the in the chat box, and um, we'll ask them at appropriate time. Um, I'll ask for questions at the end of the presentation, um, and if it's easier for you to ask your question verbally rather than typing into the chat, can you please use the raise your hand function also on the toolbar at the top, and then um, and then we'll get to you and ask you to ask your question. Uh, and please remember to unmute yourself um, when you're ask, asking that question. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Emily and um, away you go, Emily. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, listening today to this presentation. So I'm going to go straight into the subject and the outline for the day. So this part one will cover the problem with problem weeds in cane and highlight the importance of uh, weed ecology and understanding how how we grow how how they impact on um, on a crop. Uh, secondly, I'm also going to cover the economic impact first of weed competition and also of the phytotoxicity. Uh, of herbicides on cane. And as Phil said, we're going to leave some time for question and answers. Uh, just to give you a head up, what will happen in the second webinar? In a few weeks' time, you will be invited to participate in a second webinar. Uh, in this one, I will cover weed management options, uh, the current knowledge, and also future opportunities. Um, we're going to talk about chemical control, but also about non-chemical control, such as mechanical, cultural, biological control. And also follow that with question and answers and a little survey to find out what would be your favorite topic for the following webinar. So what are the problem with in cane? First of all, I'm going to talk about grasses. Grasses are prolific. They can germinate in the earliest, earliest cane stage. They grow quickly and provide a lot of competition. And they also can seed very quickly, which means the plant must be quickly controlled before it sets seeds. But at least for annual grass, the parent, the parent plant die within the cropping season. But we also have perennial, perennial grasses we, who see the parent plant survive and grow into a bean club, which are which is harder to control with herbicides. Um, in terms of chemical controls, grasses are particularly challenging because they belong to the same plant group, same family as the sugarcane. So the herbicide that controls the grass tend to also damage or kill the cane. There's only a very few herbicides that are selective to grass and not the selective to grass, selective to kind, which means they can only kill the grass and not the kind. We found out that since the industry moved into green cane trash blanketing, it's actually a very good suppressant for small seeded grass, and it's a very good tool to control our grass seeds in return. What are the main common grasses in most districts? 
We've got the barnyard grasses, the crossfoot, the summer grass, as a top rod grass, green summer grass, pink grass, bush grass, bad grass, and white sorghums. Some are mainly problems in some districts. It's a case of each grass. Uh, sour grass and imenacne, which are mainly northern grasses, while green panic are mainly southern grass. I put some um, grass name in red color when they, this, these grasses are actually environmental weeds that are found in sugarcane field. In this case, they are categories, category three restricted uh, plants under the Biosecurity Act which means that if these species are found, sorry, if these species are found in sugarcane field, the owner, the landowner is supposed to take specific action to satisfy a governmental obligation. In general, it's not to remove and not to move the plants outside the farm. The other problem um, within kind are sedges. Sedges are actually a large group. They're usually perennial and they often have triangular stems. In the sugar industry, our main problem is a nutgrass, which is present in all districts and on all soil types. It mainly reproduces using vegetative spread and its underground tubers or nuts, which means that the tillage is often ineffective because it tends to cut the chain of tubers and spread tubers all over the field. And make the problem worse in the following years. It's, uh, can, I, I can hear noises in the background. Is it a question or is it an unmute, uh, is it an unmute microphone? I guess it was unmute microphone. I keep going. Um, they, not, Nut grass is actually a bit tricky because it creates big competition in can and it's often underestimated by growers because it's such a small grass. They think that they don't have they don't have much uh, competition, but it's not the case. It actually starves the can for nutrient and moisture. Another important uh, sedge to mention is a Navua sedge, which is only found in northern Queensland. However, it's even more aggressive and competitive than nut grass. And it is in red, so it is classified in invasive plant under the Biosecurity Act. It's a picture of it on the left. Other problem within canes are the broad leaves. In general, they're easier to control because you can have selective herbicides that control broad leaves and do not harm the cane. There are a very wide range of broad leaves. And they're a bit more district and soil specific than the grasses. Some example of common broadleaf present in most districts are the blue top, also called billy goat weeds, in, depending on the district, the blackberry nightshade, rattlepole, pigweeds, and the tipweed vines, and willow primrose. Some of them are particularly troublesome, and we can cite sick pod, the giant sensitive weed, the milkweed, the same weed, and the Singapore daisy. Again, the one in red are category three invasive weed under the Biosecurity Act, so the landowner needs to take specific action to control them and not to move them to a different paddock. Next, I'm going to quickly review the vines. So the vines are also broad leaves, but they've got uh, additional features, which is they can climb and entangle the crop, lodge it, attract rats, and impede the harvester. They are quite easy to control with selective herbicides. They often need several passes and specific equipment like high rise or aerial spraying. That's because the grinds have got a long germination period, and late germinator can emerge through the canopy closure and climb, they can emerge after the canopy closure and climb through the cane to access light, to access light. And also we found that they often have very large seeds, which means these large, seed, large seeds have a lot of reserve, which means they can emerge from depths uh, over 10 centimeter in the soil and also grow through very thick mulch and use these reserve to keep growing before they can see the light. And because of that, the green cane trash blanket has effectively 
has effectively reduced the pressure from small seeded weed like grasses, as I said before. But in return, it has created plenty of space for big seeded species like vines. So in reality, the green cane trash blanketing in our sugar industry has increased the vine problems. And it's a case for all the other countries, sugarcane countries that have also gone into green cane trash blanketing. The vine problems have become more troublesome. So what are the most common vine in most districts? Pink and red convolvulus would be top of the list. The, the morning glories, bell vine, star of Bethlehem, stinking passion fruit flowers, Sirachro. Central calopo may, in Bausampere may be more northern vines and southern vines. Balloon vine is everywhere. Uh, balloon vine is actually also an environmental weed under the Biosecurity Queensland Act. And the last group I want to talk about are the parasitic plants. We actually found them very rarely in, uh, in, uh, in the sugarcane industry. So they're a bit special because instead of growing uh, on the soil, uh, they're actually attached to the root of certain crops like sorghum, corn, rice, and also sugarcane. Also, it hasn't proven to be a very big problem in sugarcane in Australia. There's not a lot of them. We, the witch wheat species rank as some of the worst agricultural wheat in the world. Um, as I said, in Australia, in sugarcane, we don't really have a problem. We have one native witch wheat striga, which is called uh, striga parviflora, uh, which we really, re very rarely see in the paddock. I've never encountered one yet. Uh, all the other witch wheat species are exotic and they are prohibited by the Biosecurity in Queensland Act. One of uh, one to, to talk about today is the red witch wheat. Um, the red witch wheat actually has been found back in 2013 in, in, in near Mackay. Uh, it has been um, uh, contained by Biosecurity Queensland on a property which is about 87 hectares on a few properties that are about 87 hectares in total that have been infested and the properties have been quarantined and the infestation hasn't spread, hasn't spread further. So now we move on to uh, next chapter which is uh, weed identification and how it is important to, to know which weeds you're targeting so to achieve a proper control. So there's a couple of tools that we have available. Uh, the 19, 1989 edition of the Weeds in Australian Cane Field, it's a green book that some of you and some growers would have. Um, and this, the content of this book has been put online on the SI website. It's called the Weed ID Tool. So both these resources use it two identification keys. One, for broadleaf, they use a key to leaf shape, and for grasses, sedge, and water plant, they use a key to seed head shape. You can see to the right of the picture that there's a key to leaf, leaf shape that is used for the broadleaf species. We are fully aware that the book and the ID tool both need updating, and hopefully future investment decision will support this update. When this happens, we consider adding and, or, and removing some species that are more or less relevant nowadays, because we are yeah, 30 years down the track. Um, we will also add some more information, uh, potentially about control. And oh, because we are in 2020 now, we will propose a new platform. And why not, if we can, a picture some picture recognition features? What is available out there? There is a, a, portal, a portal call on the web that is called the Wicktrop portal. So the Wicktrop portal is not uh, an Australian tool. It, but however, it covers uh, wheat species in Cane in other countries around the Indian Ocean. So it could be quite useful. It's a bit clunky to use, but there's a lot of resource in, in there. Uh, there's also a few fun apps available that you can download for free. Uh, for example, the Weeds of South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales. These tools mainly cover uh, environmental weeds, and so not all the weeds present in Cane are available in this app. 
And there's also a PlantNet app uh, that is actually quite interesting to use because it's got this uh, picture recognition feature. However, uh, it's a worldwide world worldwide flora in it, and obviously most of the weeds we've got in kind are not in the tool. So it's there's some platform out there. We have some tools that need updated. There's a few a few resources out there. It, 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 we need to to work on it uh, with additional funding. The next thing I want to talk about is the weed ecology, and especially three aspects of weed ecology, the weed distribution, the weed seed germination, and the weed seed spread. Starting with the weed distribution, we actually, it's largely, the weed distribution in uh, the sugarcane industry in Australia is largely unknown because we do not carry out any regular surveys. Um, Vicky Hoston in 2010, at the request of the GRDC, undertook a weed scoping study and encompassed seven cropping regions within central and northern Queensland that include the sugar industry. She, uh, sorry. she found 134. 134 weeds, including grass, sedge, and broadleaf, found that North Queensland's coast had the most unique weeds compared to other regions. She also interested, interestingly found that some problem weeds like desert top rod grass, flea vines, and cider are common across industry like the grain, the cane, the legume, horticulture, and cotton industry. So this sort of information could prompt some co-investment co to work on the weed ecology and their management across industries. So what do we know locally? Um, I carried out a study in Mackay when I was based in Mackay in 2012 and 2013, where I inspected about 2000 blocks for vine species presence. And what I found is in 2012, I found that 26% of the surveyed blocks uh, were occupied by pink and red convolvulus at some level of infestation of pink and red convolvulus. And in 2013, 17% of the survey blocks had pink and red convolvulus vines. And I also found that 3 and 2% of the blocks had natural. I found more information doing that survey. I found I could correlate that Convolvulus vine occurred mostly in blocks planted with cane variety with erect foliage like Q209 or Q200. So it's a very important piece of information when you want to replant a block that has known to have vine infestation. Maybe planting with erect foliage cane variety is not the best idea as it would make the infestation, the future infestation even bigger. On the opposite, varieties that are not self-trashing, like KQ228 or Q232, hosted less vines. So again, interesting piece of information uh, to control your vine problem. If you've got a block infested with vine, it's a good idea to plant varieties that are not self-trashing. Another piece of information we found during this survey is that most vine species were found to grow in many soil types. However, pink convolvulus, to grow on challenging soil type like solos, while other, other species didn't like solos. So again, an, an interesting piece of information. So this, this actually brings us to the fact that more distribution and survey study are necessary to understand the extent of a weed problem and to be able to correlate with other factors such as uh, location, soil type, variety, farming system, right to number or yield, and help us better understand the emerging weeds and the problem weeds. This sort of study is a baseline to understand the impact of practices, impact of events such as flooding, and also impact of things like climate change and would guide the management practices accordingly. So next I'm talking about seed germination. So seed germination is governed by internal and external factors. The internal factors are related to seed size, the type of coating or thickness of coating, the seed viability and its dormancy. 
and external factors that help break the dormancy are the soil moisture, the temperature, the oxygen, the light, the seed depth, and the presence of trash blankets. So all these factors in, uh, in influence the, dorm the, the if the, the breakdown or not breakdown of the dormancy. So we have quite a limited knowledge on the germination of sugarcane weed species in the Australian environment. We have, however, some information on the impact of trash blanket on this germination. And we know that the presence of trash blanket impedes the development of most grasses, which are small seeds, and the, their control increase with increasing trash level. And as a few reference name on that page of uh, uh, studies that have been done in different countries that prove that that prove that fact that the trash blanket impede the development of most grasses. There's been a study done in rice where they found that four tons per hectare of rice residue on the soil surface reduced each grass emergence by 50%. So it's an interesting piece of information. Work on each grass hasn't been done in a in kind, uh, but potentially we could have the same type of outcome. Now I'm going to talk about the presence of trash blanket as a physical barrier and how it impacts on and how this physical barrier impacts on vine germination in particular. So a local study by myself in 2015 in Mackay has found that a high level of trash residue, 18 tons of trash residue coming from a quite heavy crop, reduced the final number of emerged vine seedling, seedlings by about 66% compared to a thin level of trash residue. A moderate amount of trash residue coming from a more normal crop of about 80 tons per hectare would reduce the vine seedling emergence by about 32%. There is an impact on vine, but potentially not as strong as it would be on grass. And you can see on the picture the, on the right why. You can see this very, very long hippocotyl, which is all the reserves that were in that seeds are used by the emerging vine to grow that very long hippocotyl before it can actually expand these two cotyledon on the merged surface in that case. There's not many weed species that can afford to grow such a long hippocotyl before generating their own energy from the sunlight. We also found that trash residue impact vine species differently. For example, Ciratro was less impacted by vine residue. They still can emerge uh, up to 78% 70, through the mouth, while Red convolvulus emergence was only 60% through the marsh residue. Central was 66%. So there's a variation depending on the type of weeds, the type of vines. Now I'm going to talk about the presence of trash, how it in fact as a chemical barrier uh, on, uh, on the seed germination. I'm talking about a chemical barrier because the trash actually releases allelopathic compounds. So strolichites are responsible for allelopathic effect. And they, these compounds have been identified in 26 by San Pietro and Vatuan, and they are a range of acids, transferulic, cisferulic, vanillic, and syringic acid. We also know that the allelopathic effect of trash blanket varies between cane varieties. Some kinds create uh, mulch that has that release a lot of lichites that have allelopathic effect, while other kind variety release uh, lichite that have less impact on the, uh, on the germination, or they release less lichites. What do these, these lichites have, if, have impacts on weeds and also on kind? So on weeds, we found that weeds population are reduced in pots irrigated with fresh residue extract. And what is the effect on kind? Well, there can be a positive or a negative effect. Some researchers, not in Australia, it's all done in South America, has found that a low extract concentration of lichites uh, increase sugarcane germination, and they call it a hormetic effect. 
suggesting that a small amount of pain residue left on the row could prove beneficial for pain regrowth. They also found that very large amount of post residue after harvest, we're talking about 24 tons per hectare, which is more than what we would find in Australia in the sugarcane industry. We are all more around 18, 20 maximum. They found that some variety uh, exhib exhibited autotoxicity when a large amount of post cane residue was left on the road. So it's an interesting fact. Something to know is allelopathy is a trait that can be used to develop a crop cultivar and to, to do plant breeding. In organic rice production, for example, they have developed an allelopathy cultivar called Rondo. And this allelopathy cultivar in rice is, can grow and reduce wheat pressure automatically because it produces a lot of allelopathic compounds. So this can be, could also be done in sugarcane. So next I'm, going, next I'm going to talk about um, the seed spread. So every seed species, every wheat species and every seed has its favorite inherent modes of seed spread. Mainly the, the favorite mode of seed spread is the wind, the flood water, the animals or the farming activities. Farming activity are more or less the only one we can impact on. And we found that unclean machinery can transport wheat seeds from block to block, farm to farm, or even across region. And more work need to be done in sugarcane to improve the biosecurity in terms of wheat, wheat spread. Very little is done. And more work need to be done also to understand the main dissemination pathway for, the, for, the, for, for all sorts of weeds. In 2017, I've carried out, no, in 2012, I carried out a survey on harvester in the Mackay region uh, on harvesters that just had harvested a block infested with vines. And what I found when I looked at this harvester and collected the dust and particles from all over the harvester is that thousands of condolous vine seeds were located in the spiral shoes and floating rear shoe. We're talking like thousands. I think one harvester I collected about 16,000 seeds of convolvulus seeds. And I also, after talking to the contractor, we figured out that a very simple blowdown, like a five minute blowdown in this crucial area of spiral shoe, floating rear shoe, dramatically decreased the amount of seed that were transported further. And um, like we could find from 10,000, we I was less than 10. So a very, very effective tool just to blow uh, the compress with a compressor in the paddock. Oh, more work needs to be done. That was a one-off little study. We don't know anything about transport of all the other species by other type of equipment. Um, we, 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 we need to do more work in that space as well. So what work is done in, um, um, in, uh, in weed ecology? Biosecur Biosecurity Queensland investigate on a lot of weed ecology project on invasive weeds or environmental weeds. For example, they study the weed seeds dynamic of environmental weeds, cyclopod ecology and control, the ecology of, and control of aquatic weeds in Northern Australia the management and ecology of fireweed and the ecology and management of weed and custard class. Custard class, sorry. Um, also, we've got the, the GRDC, the grain industry, is investing in the ecology of feather top broadgrass and, try and, and under, to try and understand how better how it's spread I uh, have a full understanding of germination and establishment, the persistence of its seeds, and the competition on other species. Unfortunately, at this stage, there's no investment on weed ecology project in kinds. However, as I have highlighted uh, in the last few slides, the weed ecology research is necessary to understand the extent of a weed of distribution, so we can correlate with other factors like soil type, variety, farming system, return number. 
Speed ecology research help us also understand the processes that fiber or impede seed germination. And would, for example, it help us identify specific strategy like the use of green kind trash blanket I mentioned. And weed ecology research help us also understand the mechanism behind the seed spread and identify best ways to reduce it like, a, like we did with uh, the blowing down the harvester for pine seeds um, distribution. So that's the end of the ecology chapter of this webinar. Now very quickly, I'm gonna talk about the economic impact and of uh, weeds in sugarcane. So no economic study about the cost of weed competition and weed control has actually been uh, done since 2000, where McMahon found that the cost of weed control in sugarcane combined with the cost of yield loss from weed competition exceeded 70,000, 70 million annually, $70 million annually. Getting there. So what weed competition, what, what does it come from? Well, weed competition between weed and crop occur when some factors such as water, nutrients, and sunlight is insufficient to meet the needs of both the plant, the crop, and the weeds. To drill further in plant kind, yield loss from weed competition is estimated at about 2.8% per week or equivalent to $85 per hectare per week. You can see in the graph to the right that the increasing impact, we can see in the graph, the increasing impact of delayed or no weed control on cane yield compared to a season long, season long weed control. So an obvious downward trend. In return, it has also been found that up to 31% can yield loss can be recorded when weeds are not controlled between a critical phase of 30 to 60 days after ratun regrowth. It comes from a study done in India. Now I'm gonna review the economic impact of specific troublesome weed species. So for example, nutgrass, this work has been done in Australia the first two numbers come from work done by myself in 2011 in central Queensland, when we found that in plant kind, in dry land, nutgrass could impact, could create up to 27% kind yield loss. And in irriga irrigated land, it could um, create up to 18% yield loss. Uh, Rob Aiken in New South Wales in the same year found that nutgrass in New South Wales could, do, could incur 30, up to 30% yield loss, both in plant can and return. For each grass, the impact on yield, this work was done in America in 2019, and they found out that after 30 days competition between cane and each grass, 7% sugar yield loss has been uh, lost. Uh, and after 60 day competition between cane and each grass, uh, sugar yield loss is about 17%. And after a season long competition between cane and each grass, you can incur up to 43% sugar yield loss. Another species that has been studied in, in the US, uh, it's fall panicum, so it's not a species we've got in Australia. However, it's very much related to our panicum species, such as guinea grass. Um, and they found up to 63% yield loss for season-long interference and found that the critical period for control was two to seven weeks after cane emergence, so the yield loss remained below 10%. Also, an, an, an American study on cooch, uh, where they found inputs that 51% uh, cane biomass can be lost after 56 days growth in pots with one single plant cooch grass. And some impact on yield, again, work uh, from the US. Uh, they found that red morning glory could reduce yield up to 30%. 
Uh, and in India, they found that red convolvulus could reduce candida up to 25%. And in both cases, the author acknowledged that trials were cut by hand, and the impact would have been a lot worse if trial had been harvested mechanically. Another economic impact from weeds comes from the role of weeds to host pathogen and pests. This is an area that it's not studied in uh, Australian sugarcane, but however, it can be an additional contributor to yield loss. In other countries, they found that sugarcane uh, mosaic virus can be hosted on family of graminae like or grasses. Um, sugarcane yellow, yellow leaf virus it has been found in Florida on a, species, on a species of grass called sorghum almond, which is a common weed growing in the Everglade. And they're carrying, they're gonna carry out further study to determine the importance of these weeds as a reservoir for sugarcane infecting virus in Florida. Also in Florida, they found that sugarcane uh, wood weevil can be found on a range of common weeds that are also suitable food source and oviposition sites. And in this case, weeds increase the sugarcane root weevil infestation by hosting the pest. So there can be an impact on weeds as they can host pathogen and pests. It's just not studied in sugarcane in Australia. So, I've lost uh, some functionality here. Ooh. Okay, I'll try and keep going. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope I'm not gonna lose the whole presentation. Uh, your voice is fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the thing is my, I'm not sure I'm gonna still see the slideshow in a minute. Okay, so the economic impact um, can also be incurred from herbicide toxicity. Um, so what is a herbicide uh, toxicity? So the, some crops of variety are able to, or not, to detoxify a particular herbicide. This is called the inherent tolerance. So if a crop or variety can uh, detoxify a particular herbicide, it's called tolerant to its herbicide. Unfortunately, visual symptoms of crop foliage after spraying a particular herbicide can be misleading. So it's a hard way to judge if a crop is tolerant or not. This is why SI has implemented a two-stage evaluation program as in grain crops. The first stage uh, uh, relies on pot trials to test all relevant newly released variety against a range of commercially available herbicides. And we measure visual damage, but more importantly, we measure the biomass loss after 10 weeks. Next, uh, we select the combination of variety by herbicides that display significant sim symptoms in the pot trial, and we put them in a field trial in the second year, where they are grown at plant kind, where, and we measure the cane yield at the end of the 12 months growth. The results are communicated via, via the QCane Select platform and the regional variety guides. We're also going to include them in the new sugarcane weed manual update. If an herbicide, if a variety is actually not tolerant, inherently tolerant to an herbicide, we can still apply this herbicide as long as we achieve spatial separation. So how can that be done? For post-emergence herbicides, we can use directed spray. So basically you apply the chemical to the weeds and not to the crop using features like shields or droppers or irvine legs. For pre-emergent herbicides, the trick is to have actually the herbicide, herbicide band located in the soil above, above the sets, above the root zone. And herbicide band is not going to move down to the profile and ever touch that root zone because that herbicide is toxic to the kind. So we rely on spatial separation to achieve crop tolerance. 
Other symptoms of herbicide toxicity can appear down the track as, as a form um, and present themselves as plant back issues. For example, herbicides apply in the last return kind, uh, like Diron and Imazapi can impede the growth of uh, the following crop, which can be a fallow or a plow out replant kind. So we have to be careful with the herbicide we apply in the last return. Same thing, apply, herbicide applied in the fallow crop, like a legume crop, uh, to control the grasses or the broadleaf can impede can impede on the following plant kind. So there are conditions that encourage microbial, microbial degradation. Microbial degradation shorten the persistence of the herbicides. So in general, it's conditions like warm soil, a lot of oxygen, um, neutral pH, high temperature, presence of nutrients, presence of organic matter. Also condition that encourage breakdown via hydrolysis shorten the persistence of herbicides. In that case, we can think of, again, oxygen, temperature, pH. How do we measure or estimate plant back issue of particular, particular herbicides? There is an estimation that can be used by using the DT50 or the number of days it takes for 50% of the herbicide to break down in the soil. So this DT50 value, if it's above 100 days, like for trifuralin, imazetapir, or imazapic, some plant back issue can be expected. However, if the DT50 is less than 30 days, uh, which is the case for herbicide like flumioxazin, metribuzin, metolachlor, et cetera, we expect less plant back concern because these herbicides are less persistent. So to conclude today, what have I, what have I done? I reviewed the main weed problem in sugarcane very briefly, I must say. I just had 45 minutes and since I lost time, yes, I'm on track. Um, so that's done. I've reviewed the importance of weed ecology and unfortunately we're not doing enough work on weed ecology, but it's crucial. And also the magnitude of competition and the economic loss coming with um, with competition and um, herbicide phytotoxicity. And we identify a few gaps and opportunity for the sugarcane industry. And again, if you log in when we next invite you for the part two, I'm gonna present in part two all the aspect of the integrated weed management uh, and cover chemical control biological control, cultural control, and mechanical control. And that's me for today. And I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna Thanks, let Emily. Phil take over. Thanks, Emily. So um, we'll take questions now. There was, um, there was a, a question come in on the chat box from Dylan. And he asked about um, whether there's an economic impact due to yield loss due to chemical usage. Um, and I posted a response back in the chat box there that actually in Mackay, when Emily was working in Mackay, she measured the yield losses of 7 to 11% from the application of pre emergent herbicide when it was not required. But there's always a trade off between that penalty and the losses that would otherwise occur from weed competition. So um, if anyone uh, anyone else has got any other queries or comments, um, most welcome to, to um, unmute yourself and ask or um, put a note in the chat box. Um, there's um, been no uh, been no work in other in other regions relating to um, yield losses. Um, only that one one example in Mackay. And Michael has asked, Michael Witterick has asked a question. Um, in sugarcane, is herbicide resistance an issue or is it a, an unknown? Emily, would you care to comment on that? Hey, Michael, it's in part two. You have to log in again. <laughs> but to briefly answer your question, we have a few known resistance problems in 
with Parkwap uh, in southern Queensland. Not so much in sugarcane, though it's more in the neighboring crop, uh, horticulture. Um, we haven't done a survey to know exactly what's going on, but I believe some a resistance to pack what plants could be found in the southern region. I have done a little bit of work in um, in Ingham last year to test uh, some uh, cross food species for their resistance to glyphosate, and I sent them to um, the steward center and they came negative. They didn't come up as a resistance to glyphosate at all. And we are currently doing some investigation for some species in uh, the burdekin as well of crossfoods and feathered up rot grass and maybe love grass. I haven't got all the seeds yet, so they haven't been uh, fully collected and sent yet. I hope this answers your question. Thanks, Emily. Yep. Um, I can see the questions, actually. Oh, you can see them now? Okay, so there's a question yeah. about GM Roundup. Yeah, so part two, we haven't set up an invite yet. I expect it to be, it's ready, so I expect it to be slotted somewhere in the next few weeks. We will send an invite to everybody. Um, for... So GM Roundup ready? Yes, I cover it briefly in the next uh, webinar. Very briefly. Rightio, thanks, Emily. Uh, doesn't look like there's any more queries there. So the um, presentation will be available on the um, SRA website. Um, as it has been recorded. Hang on, here's another one from Priya. Is any weedicide particularly potent to the waterways? Um, Priya, would you like to clarify what you mean by that? Um, yes, uh, Phil, I was just wondering about the Great Barrier Reef. You know, is there one that has been targeted as being you know, one that will will be have to phase phase out in the future. Um, that's probably a webinar all by itself. Um, but yeah, Emily, yeah, I'll cover like it very briefly in part two as well. But very briefly, I've got two slides on runoff impact and impact from leaching. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a full uh, week weekly workshop on that one. Um, so yes, question yes. Of course, uh, herbicide would impact on uh, on aquatic life. It's written on every single label. Uh, and yes, it's some do worse than others. I'm gonna briefly cover it in the next workshop. And a query uh, yeah. from Sanaze um, about economic impact records from post-emergent herbicides in Macquarie or other regions. I'm not aware of any particular studies on post-emergent um, herbicides and and um, yield impacts, but from time to time, growers do have um, misapplications of herbicides, both pre-emergent and post-emergents, which have um, crop phytotoxicity impacts, and for sure, some of those will have yield impacts, but there's never been any study on that, as far as I'm aware. Well, the information is in, uh, you know, in the trials we do, the, the, the two-stage evaluation trials on varieties, where we record the yield uh, from a range of post-emergence herbicides. So we have uh, the information, uh, the theoretical information. However, we do not record what's happening out there, uh, if they have, you know, what's the level of impact in the community, we, we don't know that. We just know that some herbicide shouldn't be applied or should could be applied on some varieties according to our trials. Thanks, Emily. Jordan, Jordan, I think Jordan has a question. Jordan, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thank you, Phil. Uh, Emily, I just want to ask, uh, this is a follow-up of the previous questions. You mentioned about economic impact productivity are you mentioning also the environmental impact because uh, again 
the focus is the Great Barrier Reef, how we're going to improve the water quality outcome. It's good for your next presentation if you can mention that. Uh, that's very important for us, so at least we'll be more sustainable in the long term. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Yes, it's uh, completely part of the second workshop. When I cover chemical options, I I cover the negative impact of chemical strategies and runoff is on the top of the list, obviously. Thank you, Emily. No worry. Uh, another question in the chat box, which may you may um, may want to delay this one until your second webinar, Emily, but understanding the weed ecology is important and understand the economic impact of weeds. What do you consider as the priority knowledge gap that research needs to address in the short, medium and long term if you had to invest in only one thing? Um, one is hard. I prefer three. <laughs> no, you've only got one dollar. Only one dollar. Uh, if let's put it this way, if you've got not many dollars and you want to have a maximum maximum impact, you would invest in updating the the weed identification tools, uh, which are uh, nearly obsolete by now, and it would not cost too much money. If you've got one fat dollar, uh, you could invest on. Um, on more potentially distribution work uh, in different regions to have a better idea of what's the priority, number one priority for, for the different regions and, and to target this species accordingly. At this stage, we're just going blind most of the time. Say three, <laughs> that's two. Um, and the third one, I uh, would like to work more on grasses, ecology, grasses being um, one of the most troublesome problem in, um, in sugarcane. Um, we need, for, for example, let's say guinea grass and hamil grass maybe would be on top of the list. And we do not understand much about their ecology uh, in, uh, in terms of um, germination distribution, um, impact of the vi seed viability, impact of different farming practices on seed viability. We would, we would learn a lot from, uh, from that instead of automatically deferring to chemical options, which is a bit what the sugarcane industry is doing now. It's we are by default using chemical option because we don't understand our a target. We don't understand the enemy and chemical works on everything, which is, I guess, why ecology has often not been looked at properly, uh, because we have an easy way to, to deal with things, like we're using a flamethrower. Uh, so we don't need to look in, uh, in depth into uh, how the plant works and where it grows, how it grows, this sort of thing. Hope that answers your question. Thanks for the thumb up. <laughs> Jordan, have you got your hand up? Have you got another query or comment? Yeah, yeah, just an additional, I think, uh, Emily mentioned about the WID IDs. There's an apps available, but the government got a WID ID, which is not specific for sugarcane. Are you be able to uh, connect with the government and mention about the sugarcane uh, WID, so at least people can go in one apps to use that because uh, for us it's not just only sugarcane weeds but also we need to know outside sugarcane like those uh, 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 weed uh, infestations that those different class of weeds which is the government identify are you able to do that into the future to combine the sugarcane weed identification mixed with the government you know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. It 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 will depend on yeah future investment strategy and uh, and how we're gonna tackle it. We are fully aware there's a lot of resources out there, and we're not there to do the work twice and duplicate everything. 
So I would definitely like to use these existing platforms and build on them. Um, it's, I guess once we have identified a future investment priority, we can definitely be in touch with the government or other, um, other uh, crop industries, see what they've got and build, build, find some arrangement with them and collaboration and build from what they've got. It would, it, it, it would make sense anyway, not to do the work from the scratch as well. And it would, it would be more economical to, to work in partnership like that. So I agree with you. Yes. It's, I, I, I believe the government willing to collaborate because it's not just only the sugar industry. There's also weeds in the banana and other crops. But if you can collaborate with the government to work that together, that would be a great outcomes in regards with the apps that they did develop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we've got another four minutes left. If there's any other last minute questions. <laughs> All righty, so uh, nothing else. We might um, wrap that up. And um, the, uh, as I said, the recording will be available on the SRA website. And I'd just like to thank Emily for her presentation today. And I'd also like to thank um, all the participants um, for your attendance and questions. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Emily, you can stop recording now, please.